front door of the Bible, what book do you come to? Back door of the Bible, what book do you come to? Front door of the Bible, what do we find God doing in the first two chapters? He's creating. Back door of the Bible, what do we find God doing in the last two chapters? Recreation, okay, but remember from Genesis 3 all the way through to the end of the Bible, what is the bulk of this Bible about? We just brought it up in our previous topic, conflict and covenant, okay? Now, we've talked a little bit about the, 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 the history behind the great conflict. We're going to continue this discussion, and now we're going to feed in a little bit of that covenant talk. We're not completely through with the covenant, because we're going to continue to revisit this as we go through our Bible prophecy seminar, and uh, you'll see how it feeds into to the major story, even of the Bible and Bible prophecy. But we learned in the previous presentation that the great conflict of the Bible is over what? The covenant. And some of you may be like, oh, I don't know, Ryan. I, I really am not sure that that's really what it's about. Well, what I want to do at this moment, okay, what I want to do at this moment is I want to study this through the relationship between God and Israel. Because if you know anything about the Bible, and this gives me kind of a, a, a quick, a quick uh, little way to express this. You have your Bibles? Okay, I told you to bring them. Bring them every night because we're going to use them. This is a Bible prophecy seminar, not a Ryan Day seminar. So we're going to always go back to the Bible. But uh, I, want you to, I want to show you something here. What I've done is I've divided the scripture, okay? See this little tiny skinny part right here? What do you think that is? That's, the, that's what we consider the New Testament. You know what that right there is? Okay, so that's, the, that's what people would consider the Old Testament. And so you can see the major difference. I mean, more than almost, you know, two-thirds of the Bible, almost three-fourths of the Bible, is the Old Testament in which the bulk of that story is all about the relationship between God and Israel. And so, you know, it's interesting when people tell me that, oh, you know, I want to throw away the old. And this gives me a perfect, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not, I, I kind of consider it almost to be sacrilegious. And there may be some people to do this also. But, you know, I want you to take in your Bibles. Go, go to uh, the book of Matthew, right there in, 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 uh, in the New Testament. And then there should be a page or so right before the book of Matthew. What does your page say? Does yours say the New Testament? Okay, I, I, you know what, you might be braver than I am, but literally, you could just take that sheet and just rip it completely out of your Bible. Okay? Okay? Now, like I said, you may be braver than I am. I didn't rip mine. You'll see what I done with mine. What did I do with mine? I just folded it, and I kind of tucked it in there where I don't have to look at it. Okay? The reason why I'm, I'm making mention of this is because that's the absolute most useless page in your entire, entire Bible. Okay? It's not inspired by God. It was, it was devised and put in there by men, okay? And I can tell you, I don't like that page, okay? I really don't even like the one at the very beginning which says, the Old Testament. I mean, think about, think about the language of that, the Old Testament. And then you got, then you got this, by the time you finish the, the Old Testament, you know, you know that's what I kind of think when I hear that Old Testament, I think of the Old Testament. And then you get to, the, you get to this other page which says the New Testament, and then you think, hmm, the New Testament. And you know, that's exactly what this, these pages are doing, is what they're communicating, is they're communicating division in Scripture. And then people begin to take on a mentality when they read and see these pages. They take on a negative mentality in relation to, uh, you know, the, the story of the Bible and the intentional purpose behind why God gave the Scripture the way that He did. And so what people do is they come to these pages that says Old Testament and New Testament. And then what they do is they create a division in their own mind. And that's why you have Christians running around today that say, hey, uh, I'm a New Testament Christian. I meet Christians all the time. I'll read something from the book of, I don't know, Jeremiah. And they'll say, oh, yeah, but that's the Old Testament. My friends, let me tell you something. That's the gospel. Genesis to Revelation. There's no stop. There's no division. Genesis to Revelation, that is the gospel. Jesus Christ preached the gospel, and he didn't have a New Testament. 
So the truth of the matter is, is we need to understand when we're studying this Bible, it's a continuance from the last book of the Bible, which is Malachi. Well, I'm excited too. She's excited about it. You guys need to be as excited as she is. <laughs> When you, when you finish in the book of Malachi and then you step into the New Testament, guess what? There's no break. There's no, you know, oh, pause, wait, you know, change the disc. Okay, now we're in the New Testament. You know, people treat it as if, you know, kind of like a, you know, what do you do when you, when you get a new bike? What do you do with the old one? You know, most people are like, oh, you know, ooh, I got a new bike. There's the old ones. What do you do with the old one? Throw it away. My friends, you don't throw away the old. The old is a continuance, or the new is a continuance from the old. And you're going to hear me often refer to it as the Old and New Testament just for uh, relative reasons so that we can relate to each other and know where we're at, you know, chronologically in Scripture. But I want you to know when you're studying the Bible, try not to be and fall into that mentality or that trap of separating something from, you know, between old and new as if, oh, that's the old news and all, let's get rid of that. Now we have the new. It's a continuance. And so what I'm trying to communicate at this moment is that the bulk of this Bible, when you're studying the Bible, and this even goes over into Bible prophecy. And I think I told you last night, when you're studying the book of Revelation, there's 404 verses in the book of Revelation. 270 of those 404 verses are taken directly from the Old Testament. So you cannot, it is impossible for you to fully comprehend and understand the book of Revelation without having first studied and comprehended the contents of the Old Testament. Are we together? Okay, so now that we're established that, what I want to do is I want to take us on a journey now, and I want us to study this powerful relationship of conflict and covenant between the Lord and Israel and we're going to do that now, and I'm going to do it in three stages. So I've kind of broken this up into three different stages. Three stages of Israel's history. And what we're going to look at now is stage number one. Okay, now stage number one is very important. Because many people would like to skip and go all the way to stage two or stage three. But I'm telling you, you skip stage number one and you've missed the bulk of the Bible. Okay? Stage number one, I'm going to begin our biblical journey this evening in Exodus chapter 19, and I've put uh, kind of a date time up here. Uh, I did some biblical research, uh, some historical research, and found that uh, many biblical scholars and theologians believe and agree that because of, uh, of, of uh, artifacts and different things that they found and even biblical historical documents that have confirmed that probably somewhere around 1446 B.C. is where the children of Israel, led by Moses, find themselves now at the base of Mount Sinai. So they're, they're at the base of Mount Sinai. God has brought them to Mount Sinai. Now this is where it really all begins between Israel and God, okay? Before this, God has been, he's been patient with them. He's been working with them. But they've just come out of 400 years of bondage in Egypt. God has delivered them out of bondage. Now he's brought them to Mount Sinai. He wants to crown them as his special, holy, peculiar people above all nations. Okay, But before he can do that, there needs to be a nice conversation and there needs to be some stuff established. So notice what the Bible says, beginning Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. It says, In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there... Israel camped before the mount. So there they are. They're set up camp. They're settled in. Now God is going to uh, have a conversation with Moses. Notice. And Moses went up unto God. So Moses you know, separates himself from the camp briefly. Now he goes up the mountain. Now he's going to have a conversation with God. Notice what it says. And the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Okay, so when God starts this conversation, he says, hey, Moses, come here. Now I want you to deliver a message to Israel. Here it is. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, I want you guys to help me here because I have a little bit of a hard time pronouncing this really big word in yellow here. Okay, help me out here. If, let's say it one more time together, ready? 
If, oh, that was a little weak. Let's try it one more time. You at home can also join us. Here we go. If, if, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Pause there. We're going to continue, but I want to pause there for a moment. Now, I want you to notice the context clues of this particular passage. The fact that God used the word if, what does that, what does that communicate? There's conditions. There are special conditions applied to this agreement. Now, the reason why I'm pausing at this moment, I want to, I want to make this very clear. Uh, I've seen this, I, I've seen this, you know, I, I, all my life I've, I grew up in church, but I've went to many different churches through the years. I've studied with many different denominations, many different people. And I am astounded, okay, I'm astounded, I just have to admit, I am overwhelmed by the fact that there are many people who are of the belief, even still today, that the nation of Israel... That is what they consider to be the Jews over in Jerusalem, over in the Middle East there. The nation of Israel are God's special crowning champions of the world whom God loves more than anyone on the planet. And, and, and just absolutely believes with all of his heart that there's no one or anyone that is more special to him or more of an apple of the eye kind of perspective than that of Israel. And, you know, I, I'm flipping through. I don't watch a lot of television, but sometimes when I'm on the road and I'm at a hotel, I'll flip through and I'll try to find the religious channels. Because, you know, I, li I like to, you know, listen to some of the other ministers, some of the televangelists, popular televangelists that people love to listen to. I like to flip through the channels and, and listen to their perspective. And, of course, many of them now you'll find are talking more and more about Bible prophecy. It's getting a lot of attention because of so ever since 9-11, pastors and ministers are talking more and more and more about Bible prophecy. And so I'll flip through the channels and I'll find, you know, one of these big name, big wig, you know, popular televangelists, and I'll listen to their perspective. And it's interesting to me that, that they're all talking about Israel. And there's an entire network, and I didn't know this until just a few months ago, there's an entire network that people send in millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars a year 24-7 that is devoted to just, you know, amplifying and emphasizing the significance, importance, and preciousness of Israel independent and separated from the rest of the world. I mean, there's people, I mean, they, the whole network, they stand with their mind, and 24-7, they're pleading and pleading and begging the people, sow your seed of faith, send in your money, help Israel, Israel's God's people, blah, 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 blah. Now, I want to, let me take a step back, hit the pause button again. I want you to know, I love Israel. I love Israel. Do you? We should love all of God's people. It doesn't matter what, you know, color of your skin, where you're from, what country, what race, what background. doesn't matter. If God created you and you're here breathing the breath of life or have ever lived on this planet and breathed the breath of life, God loves you. Amen? And the Bible says that he's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't love this person or that person more than he loves anyone else. He loves all of his children from every race. Amen? So I want to make that very clear for the whole world to hear and see. So we're not saying that, you know, oh, you know, you shouldn't love Israel. I love Israel. I pray for them often. I recognize that it's a very hostile part of the world. Probably one of the most dangerous parts of, of this planet to ever go to. And I hate that they have to, you know, indulge and, and deal with all of the, you know, the, 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 the conflict that is going on over there. I recognize that. But I want you for a moment, okay? There may be someone in here who just absolutely despises what I'm saying right now. But I want you to be fair. And I want you now to focus your attention on the Bible. Because at the end of the day, you can disagree with Ryan Day. And that's okay. Because whether you, you agree with me or disagree with me, I love you the same. But you can't disagree with the Bible. If you call yourself a Christian, and you're going to learn this in this prophecy seminar, there's two types of people in the last days. Are you ready? I'm going to give you a new word in your vocabulary. There's Christians, which we're all aware of, and then there's selfians. Yeah, I know, that's a new word. Weird, isn't it? Yeah, I created that word. It'll be in the dictionary one day. There's Christians, listen very carefully, 
There's a second group of people in the last days. Selfshins. Okay, notice the root word. What's the root word of Christian? Christ. Okay, now let's take it again. I'll say it one more time. Maybe you didn't hear me. Selfshins. Kind of like Christians. Selfshins. Two types of people in the last days. You fall in one or two of those camps. Every person in this room, every person watching, every person in this planet falls in one or two of these camps. You're either a Christian or a Selfshin. Okay? There is no middle. There's no straddling the fence. There's no third group. Christian or Selfshin. Okay? Now, you may disagree with Ryan Day, but at the end of the day, if you call yourself a Christian, the Bible says you make yourself a representative of Jesus Christ. And when you make yourself and declare yourself to be a representative of Jesus Christ, guess what Jesus says? He says, you can't have me apart from my word. It all comes as a package deal. And so when we focus our attention on what the Word of God actually says, man will fail you a thousand million times throughout your lifetime. They will communicate lies and deceits, and some of them maybe even innocently, because they're just passing on information, what was taught to them. But my friends, I'm talking about things that people have actually studied. I'm talking about, you know, real hardcore studying, really reading the Word of God and what it says. And let me, let me tell you something. This is very important. When it comes to the subject of the covenant, do your research. Don't let someone come up to you and say, oh, that covenant, it's done away with. Jesus Christ nailed it to the cross. It's all again. Notice this. 1446 B.C., God calls Moses. He says, look, these are going to be my people. Only if there are special conditions placed on this agreement. In other words, the children of Israel could have been the reigning royal champions of the world in God's eyes only if they continue to agree and live responsibly according to this covenant. So he says, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. He continues on, notice, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And I want to stop and pause here and ask this question. Notice how God's asked them to obey his voice and keep the covenant. You know what I hear more and more Christians coming to tell me today? And you know what, the, the carnal, selfish side of me gets a little angry. That's one of my weaknesses. I'm, I'm a little impatient and sometimes I get a little, little angry with my brethren when they say something that is completely un, out of harmony with God's word. So I pray and say, Lord, help me with that. So the, the selfish, carnal side of me gets a little upset when someone comes to me and presents something as if it's truth but it's completely out of harmony with God's word, okay? Now, when I say this also, my heart also breaks. When I hear someone come to me and say, Ryan, we can't keep the Ten Commandments. We can't keep the covenant. That's why God sent his son. Because he recognized that pff, he was hoping that these people would keep those commandments, but they couldn't. So because they couldn't for all those years, that's why God finally said, well, I love them. <laughs> and I guess if I'm going to let them in the kingdom of God, I guess there has to be someone to come and do it right. And so he sent his son and Jesus done it perfectly so that now we can just take all of the efforts, all of the deeds, all of the merits, place it on Jesus and say, praise the Lord that Jesus has done what I cannot do. Amen. And then we're saved by grace and we go to heaven. But here's what's interesting. The Bible don't teach that. I will openly admit that you and I, in and of our own efforts, we can't keep the Ten Commandments. Okay, notice what I'm saying. Even the viewers at home, check this out. You and I, in and of our own independent efforts, we cannot keep the Ten Commandments. You can try it all you want, but at some point in time, doing it on your own, you will miserably fail. It has been proven over and over and over again. But let's just speak in very general, practical terms here. Is it impossible for anyone to keep the Ten Commandments? That's not biblical. 
So for a Christian to come to me and say, oh, Ryan, it's just absolutely impossible. That's why Jesus came and done it. No, no, no. Jesus came and done what he done because he loves us so much that he wanted to give us a second chance. He wanted to show us that it is possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to ask you this question. The fact that God told the children of Israel nearly 1,500 years before Jesus Christ would even be born... The fact that he asked them to keep his covenant and obey his laws and his voice, was it impossible for them to do that? Would God have asked the children of Israel to do something that was impossible for them to do? That's why it amazes me when I hear a minister or any Christian say, oh, you know, they just couldn't do it. No, no, they couldn't do it because they tried to do it on their own. But when you flee to Jesus and you ask for God's divine intervention in your life and you say Lord I recognize that if I do this in my own I'm going to fail 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 but praise God that you have provided your leading guiding spirit to give me power to overcome see that's the key to living the Christian life Israel didn't get it some of them did but many of them did not get it notice what it says here and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now notice it says, And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. Okay, now get this. He brings it for them. He tells them this is what God said, okay? This is the agreement. If you're going to be his special, peculiar, holy nation, a kingdom of priests, then you have to obey his voice and keep the covenant, okay? Now notice the response of the people. Here it is. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. Did they agree? Did they understand the terms? They did. Now, I believe there's also a flaw in their response. Oh, there's a flaw in that response. You say, well, well, they had to give some kind of answer. They did. While they gave a correct answer, they also gave a wrong answer. Because in their correct answer, there was something about it that was wrong. Because, yes, they did agree, and they should have. But the problems that they had is that they said they will do it. Oh, we'll do it, Lord. <laughs> Don't worry. We got this. We will do it. You see, a Christian in these last days must understand something. You must agree to be obedient to the Lord. God demands obedience from his people. But does he leave you comfortless? Does he leave you without a guide? Does he leave you without help? Absolutely not. And so what happens many times is we engage in an agreement, but yet in that agreement, much like Israel, we say, oh, I've got this, God. I'll take the steering wheel of my life. I'll do just fine by myself. And that's where we fail. Are we together so far? Okay, so all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words unto the people, of the people unto the Lord. Now, are you ready for this? Check this out. So they agree. Remember that, remember that, little, uh, that little illustration I gave you earlier? Okay? New Testament, Old Testament. The bulk of that Old Testament right there, you know what it's all about? Are you ready for this? Have you read your Bible lately? Right there. That's what the entire, the bulk, I'm not saying all, okay, because God had his faithful men and women who understood the relationship. But, but, but don't, don't, don't miss the point. The bulk of that right there is the people that while they agreed to keep the covenant, they signed on the dotted line. They also proved that they were going to do it and try to do it by themselves. And therefore, because of this, the record shows 840 years of rebellion that followed from Mount Sinai onward. You go read it. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 
1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. Just read on through it. All you find all the way through the major prophets, the minor prophets, all the way through is God constantly pleading with his people, Hey, do you not remember the covenant that you made with me? Let me give you an example. Notice this. 2 Chronicles 36, 14 through 16. Moreover, all the chief of the priest and the people, what did they do? Okay, notice that same word is the same word that is used over in uh, Ezekiel 28 describing the situation of Satan. He transgressed God's commandments by committing iniquity. Transgression of what? Remember? 1 John, or, yeah, 1 John 3 and 4, sin is what? transgression of the law. Notice, they transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers. Don't miss this part. He sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending them. Why did he send messengers? 840 years of rebellion why did he send messengers? You know, the truth is, you know what the children of Israel deserved immediately after the agreement they made? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. They immediately deserved death. But you know what's interesting? The Bible says God sent messengers. Why? You'll read it right here in this text. Because he had compassion. compassion. You see, he could have just wiped them all out. Goes, you know what? You, you agreed. You knew the terms, but you rebelled over and over and over and over. But that wasn't God. He said, oh, I love you. I don't, I don't want to punish you. I don't want you to die. I don't want you to perish. And so he would send his messengers. He would send the prophets. He would send the major, the minor prophets to plead with them. Turn away from your sin. Turn away from your transgression. Come back to the Lord. Repent and he will forgive you. He will wipe the slate clean and he will give you and provide you with the power to overcome. But notice it says he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against the people till there was no remedy. And so after 840 years of constant rebellion, which by the way is the majority, the bulk of the Old Testament story, the destruction of Jerusalem came in 606 BC, not because it was God's plan for that to be so, but because that's the route that the people of God chose. Now we read about this in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 17 through 20. You got your Bibles? I want you to read this. I want you to see this for yourself. 2 Chronicles, right here in the New Testament. So you have 2nd, uh, 1 and 2 Kings, and then you have 1 and 2 Chronicles. We'll go to Chronicles chapter 36. It's the last chapter of the second book of Chronicles, okay? Last chapter, verse 36. I'm going to begin reading in verse 17. Uh, notice what it says very clearly here. Therefore, and we're going to verse 21. Therefore, he brought upon them, because of their choice, he, they, he brought upon them the king of the Chaldeans. You know, who the, you know who the king of the Chaldeans are? We talked about him last night. Who, what, what, who, rep, who was represented by that head of gold? The kingdom of Babylon. Who was the king of Babylon during the days of Daniel? King Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of Babylon. And the, the Chaldees in the Bible are simply the Chaldeans. They're, the, they're the, uh, the Babylonian people. So notice, God turned them over to the, the king of the Chaldeans who slew their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on the young men. Notice the contrast here. God had compassion. Did the king of the Chaldeans have compassion? Absolutely not. He had no compassion upon the young man, old man, or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and all his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. So now they're given over to Babylon. They're in Babylonian captivity. And by the way, I want you to notice this. God delivers them from bondage, from Egypt. A few weeks after this Egyptian bondage situation, they end up at Mount Sinai where they agree to the covenant of the Lord. But then after that moment, just weeks after being brought out of bondage, they choose as a nation for 840 years to rebel. And therefore, what do they do? 
that, that, that 840 years is sandwiched by bondage and bondage. Are you seeing this very clearly? Notice the, notice the word of the Lord here. 19, and they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all the places thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the king of Persia. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then verse 21, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three. Three score and ten years. What is three score and ten years? Seventy years. That brings us to the end of stage one. In fact, stage one is the majority of the Bible. Stage two is a much smaller portion of Israel's history, but it's found within the context of the 70 weeks prophecy found in Daniel chapter 9. You see, when God backed away and allowed the children of Israel to fall into 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Um, when Nebuchadnezzar came from Babylon, he sieged Jerusalem. He set up a siege in which eventually over a period of a few years, he completely broke Israel into pieces. He destroyed the city and he also completely obliterated, as we just read, he destroyed the house of God. This is what is historically known as Solomon's temple. It was the most splendor, most beautiful thing that God, that God had instructed and allowed his people to build for the purpose of him coming and dwelling with his people. But that all changed. When Nebuchadnezzar came, he destroyed this temple. Now, something else has happened. Check this out. This is Haggai chapter 2. This is one of the minor prophets. And now the 70 years of Babylonian captivity has come to an end. And so the prophet Haggai is bringing a message from God to the children of Israel. Notice what it says. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations. And you might say, well, how are you going to do this, God? How are you going to shake all nations? He says it in the next line. Notice what he says. And the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house, now notice, the old temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, but they're going to build a new temple. This is the temple that's going to stand during the days of Jesus. Remember, Jesus goes in and out of the temple. This is the new temple. And notice, this prophecy is pertaining to this temple that Jesus will enter. Notice, it says, this, The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the glory, notice, than the former, saith the Lord of hosts, and this place uh, and in this place, I will give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. This, my friends, I don't know if you recognize this, but the desire of all nations, who or what is this desire of all nations? Okay, for some of you who may not know, I'm going to give it to you very clearly. It's a messianic prophecy of Jesus. This is the prophet Haggai delivering a prophecy in which he's telling the children of Israel that the Messiah, he's the desire of all nations, he will come. And he will fill this new house with glory more than the first. Now I'm going to tell you, you go over to Jerusalem today and some of those hardcore Orthodox Jews who don't believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, they read this text here from the prophet Haggai and they scratch their head. They say, oh, how do we interpret this? Because, but get why they scratch their head and they're, they're completely confused. Why? Because the temple that it's talking about is the temple that was erected during the day, or actually before the days of Jesus, but during the days of Jesus. That temple was destroyed in 70 AD. The Orthodox Jews, because of their misunderstanding of the Messiah, they don't have any record of the glory of God filling that temple like it did in the days of Solomon. Or did it? 
My friends, we're about to get into something that if you've never listened for, to any sermon or any message in your life, you need to listen to what we're about to talk about in the closing moments. You see, Daniel chapter 9 presents to us one of my favorite prophecies in all of Bible prophecy. It is known as the 70 weeks prophecy. Now there's a lot of ministers today on television giving their personal interpretation of what they believe this time frame to mean and you know, how long it's going to be, when it's going to start, when it's going to end, all that stuff. But my friends, what I'm going to ask you to do with me in the remaining time that we have is follow me very closely because in this prophecy holds one of the most crucial and important keys to understanding other Bible prophecies given in the Bible. Okay? So if you can understand this one and you can get this one clearly, the rest of them will, you, you'll be able to adapt to it and understand it very clearly. Now, I'm going to show you something here. I'm going to put something on the screen called the rabbinic curse. Okay? If you go over to Jerusalem today, the highest, most authoritative law that governs the Orthodox Jewish faith is known as the Talmudic law. Okay? Any Jewish or Hebrew scholar will tell you this very clearly. Inside this Talmudic law that is the highest authoritative spiritual and religious law throughout Jerusalem, there's something called the rabbinic curse. And obviously the root word of, of rabbinic is rabbi. So it's a, it's a curse that is placed upon the rabbis who go against its advice. Okay, I'm, I'm going to put it on the screen. I'm going to read it to you, and then we're going to talk about it. Here it is. May the bones of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay and decompose of him who turns the pages of the book of Daniel to find out the time of Daniel 9 verses 24 through 27 and may his memory rot off the face of the earth forever. Now, I just got to ask you, do you think God gave this curse? Okay, so who do you think this curse originated from? Okay, now I'm going to tell you, there's a reason why this curse is a, a real established curse. I mean, you go over to, to Jerusalem and you talk to some of the Orthodox Jewish teachers, they believe in this and they, they will not study Daniel 9, 24 through 27 because they've been deceived by the enemy. See, we're going to study Daniel 9, 24 through 27 and I'm going to show you why the devil does not want that nation of people understanding these texts because it only points to one person one person okay here's what the first text says in this prophecy it's found in verse 24 notice what God says 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city now I want to pause there let me set the groundwork for what is happening Daniel the prophet is in Babylon. He's been there for 70 years, along with many other of the children of Israel. Now Daniel, because he has a very intense relationship with Jesus, a wonderful, beautiful relationship. See, Daniel recognizes, by the time you get to Daniel 9, chapter 9, Daniel recognizes that that 70 weeks of Babylonian captivity, it's almost up. He's been, boy, he's been counting the day. He knows. He recognized and had studied the message I was given by Jeremiah the prophet. So when you read the first 19 or 20 verses of Daniel chapter 9, guess what you're going to read? You're going to read one of the most beautiful prayers ever given in all the Bible by Daniel the prophet. He's on his knees and he's praying to God. And you know what he's doing? He's confessing the sins of Israel. He's confessing the sins of of himself, and he's pleading with God. He's saying, oh, Lord, because he recognizes the time's almost up. And he's saying, Lord, give your people another chance. Forgive us, God. Turn away your anger from us, Lord. We understand that we've broken your law. We recognize that we have been in constant rebellion as a people. But, Lord, if you will turn your anger away and you will have mercy and compassion on us, Lord, give us another chance. Now, what's interesting is, you know, the Bible says that, you know, God had already answered the prayer before Daniel had finished it. 
You know, I could just imagine when you read that chapter, you know, the angel Gabriel, he's just kind of leaned up against the wall waiting for uh, Daniel to finish praying. He's already there. Daniel opens his eyes and he says, while I was speaking in prayer, the angel Gabriel came to me and he said, Daniel, I've come to give you skill and understanding. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. And then the next words are, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And then he lists six things. Six things that Israel must come in compliance with by the time that this prophecy is up. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and then notice this last one, and to anoint the most holy. All right? Now notice, 70 weeks, okay? Uh, I'm not very good at math. That's why I have a wonderful wife who's an educator. She was a valedictorian of her class, and she was a math major in college, and she is in very, very smart in math. But I think we can do this very simply together. You see, 70 weeks, how many days are in a week? Seven. So if you just simply multiply 70 times seven, what are you going to get? My wife has checked my math. It's 490. And then notice here, it says years. And you say, what? Years? He said 70 weeks, and if there's seven days and 70 weeks, well, that's only 490 days. But see, you're going to learn something tonight. In Bible prophecy, according to Ezekiel 4 and 6, and also Numbers 14.34, as well as multiple other scriptures throughout the Bible, confirms that when you're dealing with biblical prophetic timing, when God gives you a prophetic day, it is equal to one literal what? Year. You know what this communicates? This communicates that God is definitely a compassionate God. Because He is the all-sovereign God. He could have told them, I'm only going to give you 490 literal days. But He didn't do that. Because that would have been just a little over a year. But rather, He gave them 490 years to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Now this is where it gets interesting. Stay, stay with me. What we need to determine is what year does the 490 year prophecy begin? Because if you know anything about Daniel's mentality, see Daniel's a prophet. So when, when he hears to anoint the most holy, Daniel knows what that language means. He knows that it's about the Messiah. And so as a prophet, he already is thinking to himself, wow, God has given us 490 years to clean up our act, and in 490 years, the Messiah is going to come. So the question is, if, we need to, if we're going to figure out when the Messiah is going to be here, we need to know when this thing begins, right? Is that a good, good, good way to start? So when does the 490-year prophecy begin? If you continue reading, notice verse 25, it gives us the answer. Know therefore and understand, and then notice the words in purple here, that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Pause. So he gives us a starting point. He says, look, there's going to be a command or a decree given in which the children of Israel will be instructed to go back and reestablish, that is restore Jerusalem back to the state that it was before Nebuchadnezzar took it away. Now, you got to understand, there's a, that's a whole lot of restoration. Because not only did he destroy the walls, not only did he destroy the buildings of the city, he, not only did he destroy the temple, but he took away their independent statehood as a nation. They were no longer an independent nation. They were literally just a, a suburb or a region of Babylon. So God tells him, you need to look forward to a command that is going to be given to completely restore and rebuild Jerusalem as an independent nation, okay? So here's what happens. We need to look in the Bible for a decree that does that. Now, many people go to Ezra chapter 1. We know that there is a decree given here, but it's not the right decree that matches Daniel chapter 9 because Cyrus gives a decree just to go build or rebuild the temple. That's not the correct one. 
Because the one in Daniel 9 is not just talking about the rebuilding or restoration of just the temple, but the entire city, the entire independent statehood of the nation of Israel. Notice here, we know that it's not Ezra chapter 4 because, again, this was just another reaffirmation of Cyrus' decree to go finish rebuilding the temple. It's not that one. And then there's some people that want to go to Nehemiah chapter 2, and if you read the text there, it's just a commission given by Artaxerxes in 444 B.C. to Nehemiah to go finish rebuilding the city because there was a time there where there was a struggle and they had to put the building project on hold. The correct decree, my friends, if you do your research properly, is found in Ezra chapter 7, verses 8, and also verses 12 through 26. And I want you to say this with me. Notice this year right here, 457 B.C. Let's say it together. Ready? 457 B.C. We can do better than that. Help me at home also. 457 B.C. Write it down. Remember it. This is your key date. Because in 457 B.C., Artaxerxes, the king at the time, gave a decree for them to go reestablish that independent nationhood and to set up judges and magistrates and to continue to reestablish and restore all that had been taken away from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar the king. That is Ezra 7, 8, verses 12 through uh, 26, and that is in the year 457 B.C. Guess what? We have our beginning point. Now, this is where I get excited, and you can get excited too. Because if you are Daniel the prophet or anyone living in this time, and you have paid attention very closely to the prophecies of the Lord, do you realize what this means? For nearly 2,000 years, you know what these people have been waiting for? Parents would tell their children about him. They would have full feast about him. For 2,000 years, as a nation, they've been waiting for the coming Messiah. Do you know what this means? That if they count from 457 B.C., 490 years from that date, from that year, guess what they're going to come to? They're going to be able to calculate the very year that Jesus would arrive, the Messiah, which they don't know him to be Jesus yet, but they know that the Messiah will come. Now you're starting to see why the devil doesn't want those rabbis studying Daniel, 20, uh, Daniel chapter 9, 24 through 27. Because if you read this, this prophecy and you study it responsibly, not only will you come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, but the Bible gives you the exact year that he would have arrived and have been anointed as Messiah. Let me show you here. Now, therefore, and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until who? Until Messiah the Prince. Notice this next verse. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Now, recognize this. Let's do some simple addition here. If you take 62 and you add 7 to it, what does it give you? It gives you 69. How many weeks are in this entire prophecy? 70. Do you realize what this text is telling us? This text is telling us that after 69 weeks have been completed, the Messiah will show up. We don't know the day nor the hour, but they could have known the very year. You and I don't even know the very year. They knew it. Which, which, which by the end of this presentation, you're going to see why it's so important for us to comprehend the significance of this message. Because the majority of Christianity today, you know what they're doing? Their attention is so focused on Israel overseas that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled all around them and they're missing it. Because they're so caught up with the nation of Israel. My friends, let me tell you something. The nation of Israel does and has played a prominent role in Bible prophecy. But at the end of the day, when we study this out, you will see that the Bible tells us how, what kind of role the nation of Israel will play. And I believe it will, be, will surprise many people when they do a responsible research.
You see, the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem was given in 457 B.C. If you count 490 years from, excuse me, 483. Notice what I have on the screen here because it's after 69 weeks. There's 70 weeks total, but 69 weeks is a total of 483 years of the 490, okay? I know some of you, are good, but your brains are about to explode. That's okay. You can restudy this. You can go back and watch this video over again, and you'll get some study guides on this uh, in this seminar. But, you know, I know some of you are probably like, whoa, whoo, whoo, this is a lot of math. But try to focus on the text here, okay? So notice here, if you count 457 B.C., 483 years later, it's going to bring you to a specific year. Something has to happen in that year, according to the Bible. Either the Bible is legitimate or it's not. And there may be someone here tonight that has been questioning the validity of the Bible for a long time. Well, guess what? I hope that you leave away from here tonight uh, a whole lot uh, excited and refocused and trusting that you can trust the Bible. Because let me tell you something, my friends. This is incredible stuff. What we're studying here is incredible stuff. This was not written by some man, you know, just a few years ago, just to deceive it. There have been generation after generation after generation that has studied this, that have recognized this. And my friends, it's powerful when you allow the Word of God to speak for itself. Let's continue to read. So notice, 483 years, something's got to happen. Now, if you go back and read the text, you know what it says? No, forth, or no, uh, no therefore, uh, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. You know what Messiah means? Messiah means the anointed one. That, that's, the very, that's the very description of who the Messiah is. He is the anointed of God, sent to deliver his people. The anointed one. Notice what the Bible says. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea. Now the reason why I'm reading this text is I want you to tuck away in your mind the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Many times we read our Bibles and we skip right over verses like this because we find it irrelevant. Oh, it's just a historical point. We don't really need to know that. There's a reason why God gave this. Because it proves something when you start digging in the Bible. Something happened in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. And notice we're in Luke chapter 3. If you keep reading down Luke chapter 3, notice what happens. Now when all the people were baptized... It came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open. And what, what did they hear coming from heaven? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So notice the historical accuracy of this. The 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Jesus Christ is baptized. The father speaks from heaven. Hey, this is my son. All right? And you say, big deal, Ryan. <laughs> whoop de doo What does that mean? Something happened at Jesus' baptism. Notice what Acts says here in chapter 10, verse 37 to 38. That word I say, you know which was published throughout all of Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Notice how Jesus, what's that word there? Anointed, notice, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power whom went about doing good. Remember, Messiah means what? The anointed one. When was Jesus anointed as the Messiah? At his baptism. What year did that happen? According to Luke chapter 3, it was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. You know what's amazing? If you do your responsible, proper uh, historical research, you will find out that the year or the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar was exactly 27 A.D. And guess what? It's if you subtract 483 years from 27 A.D., guess what year you come to? 457 B.C. I'll pause for a moment so you can get excited. That's exciting right there. That's, 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 that's awesome. I remember when I first studied this and I found that I was like, whoa, the Bible's amazing. We can really trust the Bible. This isn't some random mumbo jumbo that someone wrote. This is the divine word of God. Daniel didn't, he didn't know half of what he was writing. Some of it he related to and understood some of the terms, some of the text, but he really didn't know all that he was writing. Why? Because much of what he wrote was for us. 
It was for us to understand. It was for us to confirm and know who the Messiah is. Now notice here. Here we are in 27 AD. Let's put it in a larger perspective. We've come 483 years, which by the way is 69 weeks of the 70 weeks. How many weeks do we have left? One week. And then the vision stops there, right? We don't have any more? Oh, let's continue reading. You see, during the period of the 70 weeks, God sent additional messengers. Haggai, Zechariah, Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Malachi, John the Baptist. You know why God sent these messengers? You know what their purpose was? To prepare the people of God for the arrival of Jesus the Messiah. Did the people of Jerusalem, who was given a second chance by God, were they ready? Were they ready as a nation to receive Jesus as Messiah? Oh, my friends, this is where we come to our third and final stage. Notice this because we're going to get through it quick, but it makes perfect sense. See, now we've come to this final week. And you'll see that I've broken this final week down into two sections. There's a division. There's something that's going to happen in the middle of this week. Notice what the Bible says. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Okay? Now, the reason why this is written this way, and many people have probably wondered, you know, wait, wait, Jesus came after 69 weeks, not after 62 weeks. If you go back and read Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, it says, very, actually it's verse 20, yes, yeah, verse 25, it says very clearly there that the Messiah shall come, but notice, it says, it first says seven weeks and 62 weeks. And there's a reason why it says it in that way. Seven weeks and 62 weeks. You see, the seven weeks is how long it took them to rebuild the temple. And then there's a, there's a divisional time period between the seven weeks and the 62 weeks historically because there was lots of strife and struggle historically. There was lots of war going on that actually halted the building project and the continuing of the restoration of Jerusalem. But... Then a period of 62 weeks follows, and that's why it says here, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Was the Messiah cut off for himself? Who was he cut off for? You can raise your hand. It's you. He was cut off for you. Notice what it continues to say in verse 27. And he, who's he? Do you know the majority of Christianity says that he here? Is an antichrist? See, this is why we have to study this. I'm not here to bash any other, anybody else's denomination or religion. But I can speak out of experience because I was a part of the Oneness Apostolic Pentecostal Church for years. I was a part of the United Pentecostal Church for years. I was a part of the Church of God, the Assembly of God, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the Church of Christ, many other non-denominational churches before I came to where I am today. And my friends, I want you to notice unanimously what was taught in almost every single one of those church denominations that I was once a part of, that this he in this verse is the Antichrist at the end of time. I have a problem with that. Because either it's the Antichrist or it's not. And if it's not the Antichrist, there's only one other person it can be. The true Christ. And if there's somebody else teaching somebody else that this is not the true Christ, but rather an Antichrist, we have a problem. This, this, this becomes very, very salvational when you start to apply a prophetic text, very powerful such as this one, to someone other than Jesus Christ, if it is truly to be applied to Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Okay, hang with me. We're almost finished. And he, that's Jesus, shall confirm the covenant. How do I know this he is Jesus? Right there. Blue words. Read those blue words. There ain't no antichrist that can confirm any covenant. There's only one covenant and only one covenant giver. And only the covenant giver can confirm it. He, and where a lot of people get confused is the translation here. They think that because it's not a capital H, then it must be the Antichrist. No, no, no. That's just a, a, a grammatical error. But he is Jesus. He confirms the covenant with many for how long? One week. See, Jesus is going to make sure that the people are given that extended last 70th week. But then notice what the Bible says. In the midst of the week, that final week, he, who's he? Only Jesus shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That is, the sacrificial system and the offerings thereof are going to come to an end. Who's going to bring an end to that? 
An antichrist? Can, can an antichrist really bring an end to sacrifices and offerings? Oh, he can try, but he don't have that power. Only Jesus does. Something, my friends, had to happen in the middle of that last week. And you better believe that something very, very significant did happen. Because up on top of Golgotha Hill, Jesus Christ is going to breathe His last breath after saying, It is finished. And at that very moment, the Bible says, after Christ dies, there's an earthquake. And when that earthquake happens, there's something else happening in the temple at that same time. It says, And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. If you read the writings of Josephus, the Jewish historian, you know what he says? He says, At that very moment, the high priest Caiaphas has a knife in his hand and a lamb on the altar. And it was Passover. See, Jesus was that Passover lamb, the lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And Caiaphas was one of the leaders in making sure that Jesus Christ was crucified because he didn't believe in Jesus as the true Lamb of God. That's why he had that replacement there. And as he's about to bring that knife down, Josephus says that that earthquake happened, the veil in the temple was rent, and the Lamb that he had got away. <laughs> because the true Lamb of God had just given his life for all. And the, the high priest runs inside the temple and he sees the veil was rent. Notice, not from the bottom to the top, because if it was rent from the bottom, guess what they could have said? Some, uh, some you know, uh, evil person came in and cut it and rent it from the bottom to the top. But it wasn't rent from the bottom to the top. And if you knew how big this temple was, it was huge. And that veil was so thick and so heavy, it was rent from the top to the bottom. Only the work of God could have done such a thing. My friends, exactly three and a half years after Jesus is anointed as Messiah, he dies as the Savior of the world on the cross. And he brings an end to all sacrifices and offerings. Are we through with this yet? Hang with me. Before Jesus died, about a week before he died on the cross, he said this to the leaders of Israel. Okay? Now, if you don't get anything else, then I get this one. Because there may be someone here tonight that says, uh, Ryan, I don't know if I can really go with this because I believe that Israel is Israel and they're going to be the major. Okay, notice what Jesus said to the nation of Israel, the leaders of Israel, one week before he's arrested. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? Which stone is he talking about? He's talking about himself. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now notice what he says. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. He's speaking to them as a nation. And given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. When did that happen? Three and a half years after Jesus died on the cross. There's a young man by the name of Stephen. Stephen is preaching the same message in the streets of Jerusalem and it gets under the skin of the Pharisees and so they, they arrest him and they bring him to the high Sanhedrin court. It's basically the Supreme Court of Jerusalem. And he pleads his case to the court and he's preaching the same message that you're hearing tonight, the history of Israel, all that had been done against the Messiah, Jesus. And then this is what the Bible says happens. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears. That is, they put their finger in their ears. Oh, we don't want to hear this. You see, there's a lot of people that do that to the gospel. La, 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 la. Don't want to hear it. My friends, that's very dangerous. It says, they stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, this is Acts chapter 7. You know what happens in Acts chapter 8? That young man named Saul, guess what he's doing? He's persecuting the Christians. And then you come to Acts chapter 9. Guess what happens in Acts chapter 9? That young man named Saul who's persecuting the Christians in the name of God, he's on his way to Damascus to arrest and persecute more Christians. But on his way there, he's knocked to the ground. And he has an encounter with Jesus. It says, but the Lord said to him, notice what, God, what, notice what Jesus says to, to what now is Paul. 
Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before who? Gentiles. Notice, now Jesus is saying, look, I want you to take this gospel now to the entire world. We've been so focused on Jerusalem for so long. You know what? Let's, let's open this thing up. I want you to take the gospel to the world. Take it to the Gentiles. It says kings and... Did God give up on Jerusalem? No, no, no. What did he say? The children of who? But then notice what he confirms also in Acts 22, verse 21. Then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. My friends, the 70 weeks of Daniel ends with the gospel going to the Gentiles. That's why Jesus said the, the, the fruits will be taken from you, the kingdom of God will be taken to you and given to a nation who will bear the fruits thereof. God did not completely abandon Israel, but they were no longer biblically his chosen vessel of honor because of their constant rebellion and ultimately because of the rejection of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So did he abandon them? No, he loves them. He stayed with them, but now he's opened this thing up to anyone who will accept Jesus Christ. That's why we see this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 29. For you, who? For you all, notice, are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you, notice, are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You can get excited. I'm happy about it. I'm so excited right now. Woo! You see, when I look at this right here, I know this is just an artist rendition of Jesus hanging on the cross. But you and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. This whole Bible seminar is all about that right there. We can talk about all of these symbolic things of Bible prophecy, and we're going to talk a lot about stuff. We're going to talk about all the deep things. We're going to talk about the Antichrist tomorrow night. We're going to talk about beasts, and we're going to talk about nations, and we're going to talk about, you know, all the heavy symbols. We're going to talk about, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the mark of the beast, and, and all these other great, great things that we find that people wonder about in Bible prophecy. But my friends, notice this, and don't ever forget it. When you get away from the cross, you're getting away from God. Because it's at the cross that all of this begins to make sense. When I, when, I, when I look at this picture here, I think of a song. A song that I was taught many years ago. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace that bought my liberty. I do not know just how he came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I shall forever lift mine eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. That's the gospel. And I don't know what your life looks like over the next month, but I pray that you'll be here every night because if there's any ever a time that we can give to Jesus, it's now. We need to learn, we need to grow, and we need to surrender now that we have a chance. Because he gave all for us. The only question is, are you willing to give all for him? I'm going to be here till the 24th, Lord willing. And I'm excited to be here to preach the gospel. But my friends, it wouldn't matter if I'm here or if anyone else was here. Jesus could make that chair right there give you the gospel if he wanted it. 
But I pray that you're here. Not because I'm here, but because Jesus will be here. And there's something that he wants to show you. There may be church members here that say, oh, you know what, I've learned all this already. I know it all. I've heard it a million times. We learned this morning in church that we are living in Laodicea. We've become lukewarm. Jesus is calling us to revival. That includes me just as much as it includes you. So every single night, not only am I going to be preaching to you, I'm going to be preaching like this. Because I'm going to be stepping on my own toes just as much as I might step on yours. But I don't do it in harm. I do it because Jesus loves us. And the Word of God shall set us free. Amen? Amen. Let's stand as we close, my friends. Tomorrow night, 5.30, two presentations on the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. In the first presentation, we're going to be showing the very goal, purpose, and agenda of the Antichrist. But in the second presentation, this one might surprise you. In the second presentation, I'm going to show you from the Bible who the Antichrist is. And you to, I'm also going to share this with you. Not only is it going to be so clear, it's going to be so clear that I'm not even going to have to tell you who it is. You're going to tell me who it is. You may say, but Ryan, the Antichrist hasn't come yet. Are you sure? I pray that you'll be here tomorrow night. Bring a friend. Bring yourself. I pray that these empty seats that we see here are full. You have control over that. Go invite. You can't make people come, but you can certainly do all that you can to get them here. I pray that you bring yourself, bring a friend, bring a family member, bring a coworker. Let's pack this house out. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, praise you, God. Thank you for your love, your mercy, your continual grace that you bestow upon your people every single day. Thank you for the cross of Calvary, for we recognize that without Jesus, we can do nothing. And so, God, I pray that as we leave here tonight, may we recognize that each and every one of us need Jesus every single day. That he has given all for us, and that now it's our time to surrender all that we have to him. So I pray, Lord, that as a people, you will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Bring us all back tomorrow night safely. And may you fill us with the Holy Spirit to be drawn closer and closer to our uplifted Savior. We praise you and we thank you forever. And we ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.